Some of you may know this about me and some may not know this about me, but I am a classic stress eater. Some people turn to alcohol under stress, others turn to caffeine. I turn to beloved cheese. And I know I'm stressed if I start unconsciously snacking all throughout the day, not even fully aware of what I'm doing. It's almost like I become a zombie, but instead of seeking brains, I'm just seeking out cheese, cookies, give them to me now. And over the years, I've learned to sort of catch myself when I start falling into that pattern and correct my behavior. Because what I've also learned over the years is that gorging on garbage, filling my belly with food that has little to no nutritional value does not help my stress. Imagine that. <laughs> it doesn't actually help. In fact, it often makes the stress worse. It negatively affects my brain and my body. My ability to handle the stress goes down the worse and worse food I eat. Food has a huge effect on our mental, emotional, and physical well-being. And we've known this for quite a long time. In fact, there's a man named Jean Anthelm Brillat Savarn. And in 1826, he wrote a book called The Physiology of Taste. And he wrote this, tell me what you eat, I will tell you what you are. Now, we translate this in our culture, you are what you eat, right? We've heard that phrase, at least. So going all the way back for 200 years, and probably longer than that, we have recognized that food affects our well-being. Our bodies are constructed out of the physical materials that we consume. And this has led to people being very careful in our present day. People are super careful about what they eat often all sorts of different diets. And it's important because we know that we have a tendency as human beings to eat and drink ourselves to death. Not to give our bodies life, but to actually harm our bodies. So what we feed our bodies matters. But this morning, we're confronted with a far more important question than the food that we eat. And the question that our scriptures ask us is this, what are you feeding your soul? Right? We're aware of what we're feeding our bodies, but what are you feeding your soul? St. Augustine put it like this, Whereas people desire meat and drink to satisfy hunger and thirst, real satisfaction is produced only by that meat and drink that make the receivers of it immortal and incorruptible. In other words, what he's saying there is, what are you feeding your soul? What are you putting into your soul? Because your soul is eternal. That's what counts. So what are you eating? What our scriptures this morning teach us is that it is only when our, we fill our lives with Jesus that our souls can thrive and flourish. Just like our bodies do not function well when I feed them cheese and cookies, our souls do not thrive and flourish unless we're feeding them Jesus. So how do we do that? How do we put Jesus into our lives? How do we bring Jesus into our lives? There's three things I want to talk about with you this morning. First, receive, remain, and relearn. So first, receive. The first step to connecting our souls to what they need to thrive and flourish is that you have to receive Jesus. It all starts with receiving Jesus into our lives. At first, our reading from the Gospels uh, was quite confusing. If you listened closely, I don't know if you were listening closely this morning, but it was quite a confusing reading because what Jesus is saying sounds a lot like cannibalism. Listen again to what he says. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood... You have no life in you. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him up on the last day. For my flesh 
is true food and my blood is true drink. Whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me. So what is Jesus talking about here? Was Jesus promoting cannibalism? Well, the answer is no, he was not. Although, when you go back in church history, there's all these accounts of different Roman figures thinking that the Christians were practicing cannibalism because they talked a lot about eating bodies and drinking blood. And to us, I think, particularly as Anglicans, where we do weekly communion, it can almost seem sort of normal. It doesn't even strike us as strange, the language that we're using. But the language that we use when we talk about the body and blood of Christ could be confusing to an outsider. I remember uh, a church I was previously at, there was a Hindu who was visiting our church for the first time, and they were very confused by this concept that we were eating flesh and drinking blood. Very confusing for them. I mean, imagine if instead of saying, you know, the body and blood of Christ, we started saying the body and blood of Brian. That would be a little confusing and disconcerting for people coming into our church. What is with these people? They like to pretend like they're eating each other. What's going on here? So what is Jesus really saying to the crowd? Jesus was using food, this daily thing that we need, this daily reality for everyone, to help us understand exactly what his whole life was all about. He's using food to talk about his life, ministry, death, and resurrection. Eating food necessarily means that one living thing is giving its life to another living thing. This is true with animals and with plants, right? So in order for us to survive as human beings, we need to take the life from something else and give it to ourselves, right? We harvest crops. We kill animals. Rod Whitaker uh, in his commentary on this passage says this. He says, eating and drinking is the laying down of life by a plant or animal and the interpenetration of life as molecules are transferred, thereby nourishing life. There is no sharing of life without the laying down of life. All true life is sacrificial. Everything is sacrificial. Think about it. Something has to die for you to live. This is a profound mystery that's woven into the created order, and it's meant to point us back to the Lord Jesus, to help us realize this fundamental truth of the gospel, that when we are eating and drinking the body and blood of Christ, we're being reminded that Jesus laid down his life to give us life. When we share communion, we are reminding ourselves of that. We are receiving, quite literally, the life of Christ into our life. It's a reminder that our eternal life required Jesus to lay down his life. Jesus says, whoever feeds on me, he also will live because of me. It's a way for us to, to personally and corporately proclaim that Jesus really did die for us. For you, for me. Many of you probably have seen this. Those who are younger may not have seen it, but there's a, a famous movie called Saving Private Ryan. Has anybody seen this movie? Okay. It was popular at one time. I'm, I'm getting older. But anyways, in the movie Saving Private Ryan, there, which is all about there's basically a group of soldiers, and they're led by their captain on a mission to save one soldier who's behind enemy lines, Private Ryan. So the title of the movie is Saving Private Ryan. And so they, they go there, and the captain um, has, has gone to save him, but he ends up getting very badly wounded, and he's about to die. And in the captain's final words to Private Ryan, he says this, earn it, earn this. In other words, what, what he's saying to Private Ryan there is, let your life be worthy of the life that I am laying down. And the final scene of, of the movie is, is Private Ryan, now with all of his family, all of his children and grandchildren, all gathered around the tombstone of the captain. And he asked a profound question. He said, did I earn it? Did I earn it? 
And what I want to say to you this morning is that you are like Private Ryan. Living life because someone laid down his life. Jesus laid down his life to give you a new life. Now I want to be clear. You did not earn the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will never earn it. I want to be clear about that. But imagine how your perspective would change if every day you approached with this knowledge, I am living today because someone gave their life for me. How would that change your view of your everyday life? How would that change how you approach your relationships? I am only here because someone laid down their life to give me life. Jesus says, whoever feeds on my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me and I in him. It's a, it's a stunning statement. Leon Morris, in, in reflecting on these words, wrote, they appear to be a very graphic way of saying that people must take Christ into their innermost being. You know, Jesus is not content to stay far away from us. He wants to be very close to you. He, he's living life through you. He's giving you his life. He laid down his life to give you his life. And in fact, the last command that he gives to his disciples is he says, um, he says, eat his body and drink his blood. Take me into your life. I'm giving you my life to take into you to live out a new kind of life. And so that's the first thing I want you to hear is it all starts with grace. It all starts with understanding that Jesus laid down his life to give you a life. Receive Jesus. Receive this good news of the gospel. It's every single day that we need that reminder, this good news of what God has done for us. That's, that's like water to a thirsty soul. It's like bread to a hungry soul to know that Jesus loves you so much that he laid down his life for you. And when we don't know that, when we don't know that daily, we'll start to go hungry. We'll start to try to fill our souls with food that doesn't satisfy, with drink that doesn't quench our thirst. And so we need to receive the good news every day. Jesus died to give me life. And I want to there's something I found helpful. It's something that I learned uh, actually back in high school, shortly after I became a Christian. Someone shared this with me. They said, every time you see a cross, just say to yourself, Jesus died to give me life. Really helpful thing. We see crosses all the time, right? Every time you see a cross, just remember, Jesus died to give me life. When you come to communion on Sundays, as you're taking the body and blood of Christ, say, Jesus died to give me life. It changes our perspective. It feeds our souls. Second, so we, we, we have to receive Jesus. We have to remain in Jesus. When we receive Jesus, we have to remain in Jesus. You know, the hardest part of, of, of waking up in the morning is that you have to get out of bed. Everything's great and hunky-dory while you're laying in bed, but then you have to get up eventually. And the same is true with receiving Jesus. Eventually, you've got to remain in Jesus. You have to carry him through the day. Our passages not only point us to the sacrament of communion, but also that we need help, that we need a community. Not only do we need to know and receive Jesus, but we need to be connected to a community. St. Augustine says that communion was always intended to point us to community. He writes this, Our Lord has chosen for the types of his body and blood things that become one out of many. Bread is a quantity of grains united into one mass. Wine is is a quantity of grapes squeezed together. And it was not just grape juice. That was, <laughs> you also have to ferment it, but, but it was squeezed together. We cannot receive communion without community. The bread and wine are the body and blood of Christ when the body of Christ gathers together. And so being with other Christians nourishes and feeds our souls. Hebrews 10.24 says this, and let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day appearing. God created us to be in community. God is spiritually present to us through a gathered community. I had a friend who's a musician, uh, not an Anglican at all, and he was visiting our service. 
And uh, after the service, he, uh, he came up to me and he said, wow, you guys sing a lot of songs in your church service. Jill is nodding vigorously. I'm sure Sally's nodding wherever she is. We have, we have almost an absurd amount of songs in our service, if you think about it. I think it's something like, what, 11 or 12 songs that we sing on an average Sunday? And it never really occurred to me before, but we do sing a lot. And it's sort of an odd thing, right? I mean, there aren't a lot of social circumstances where people get together and all sing communally. I mean, there's like karaoke or something, or maybe at a concert, but, but not really. There's not a lot of time, places where we do this. But, but that's about it. But as our psalm this morning pointed out, it's a good thing to sing praises unto God. It's actually feeding our souls because what's happening is that we are blending together all these different voices into a single act of praise. We're actually being united together as a community. I don't know if you've ever experienced this, but you know, I, I'm not like a a chipper person, you know, all the time. And I've had these experiences where I come into a worship service and maybe I'm not, maybe I'm feeling a little tired, maybe I'm a little distracted thinking about other things. But by the end of the service, as we've been singing together, all of a sudden I'm built up, I'm, I'm lifted up. As I've, as I've started to worship with my brothers and sisters in Christ, it's, it's elevated me in a way. It's built me up, it's encouraged me. It's feeding my soul. It's feeding my soul. And so I know um, that it can be a challenge sometimes to come into worship. I've had those Sundays, and I'm a priest. But it's a way that we can be fed. God wants to feed your soul through Christian community. Don't neglect this opportunity to feed your soul. We're going to get busy. We're already getting busy. There are many demands on our time and energy. Do not neglect to gather with other Christians be fed by God's spirit. It's for your good. It builds you up. We need, we're designed for community. And then the third thing, uh, so, you know, we need to receive Jesus. You know, we, we need to remain connected to Jesus by staying in community. And then this one's a bit strange, but I want to explain to you. Um, we need to relearn. We are always in need of relearning the love of God. We need to constantly be reminded and relearning the love of God for us. So in addition to these other ways of connecting, um, we have to keep pressing on and studying and relearning his love for us. And the primary way that we do this, the primary way that I've discovered in my life, is by reading the Bible. The Bible is where we go to feast our souls on the love of God. St. Augustine uh, once once said that um, the Bible says nothing but speak of the love of God. The Bible does nothing but speak of the love of God for us. And, and that's what the Bible is. Proverbs 9, on our reading, invites us to come, eat of my bread, and drink of the wine I have mixed. Leave your simple ways and live and walk in the way of insight. What is the author of Proverbs talking about here with this wine and bread? What's going on here? Well, actually, the author is inviting the reader into the Bible, to read the Bible. The author is saying, the words in these scriptures are like a rich banquet, a feast that has been spread out before you, for you to enjoy. You are invited to come and feast on this bread and wine in the biblical text. So I think when we think about reading the Bible, too often we approach it like some sort of duty or chore, which honestly, sometimes it can feel that way. Uh, when I get up in the morning and I'm, I'm listening to the scriptures on praise you go, sometimes I have to listen to it two or three times because I was checked out the first time. You know, it can feel like a duty when I, when I open my Bible and start to read and sitting in my office and starting to read the Bible. It can be, uh, it can be a chore. It can feel that way. I'm not always excited. But listen to how Proverbs 9 describes reading scripture. Here's how, here's how the author describes it. Wisdom has built her house. She has hewn her seven pillars. She has slaughtered her beasts. She has mixed her wine. She has also set her table. It describes it as someone who's carefully and methodically prepared a feast. Christ invites us to nourish and feed our souls on the word of God written, to enjoy it as a feast. I want to encourage you, if you're here this morning 
you are hungry for God, if you, if you kind of look at the condition of your soul and you say, you know, I've actually been putting a bunch of garbage in there. I've been garbage eating in my soul. I want to encourage you. The Lord is inviting you this morning to a rich feast that will feed your soul. He is prepared to meet with you in the words of Scripture. He has given you this incredible gift of, of the love of God revealed in Scripture. Don't stuff your soul with food that does not nourish and satisfy. God has spread a banquet in the Bible just for you. So what are you eating? What feeds you? What are you, what are you putting into your soul? Don't feed your body and neglect your soul. Receive Jesus. Receive him. Receive the love of God every day. Relearn over and over again. Remain connected to the Christian body. And know the love of God for you. Amen.